before you come back, Richard Milton, the executive director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. A lot of things to talk about. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back right after the week. Good morning, all. Uh, good to have you joining me and Don Needle. You are listening to feedback on this Friday, January the 19th at 10 a.m. And uh, this is the program where Don and I talk about current issues, politics, events, uh, all of that from a biblical worldview. Don is a longtime friend. Uh, he's in Russellville, if you don't know, WRUS in Russellville. Don is a Kentucky Broadcaster Association Hall of Famer, and he's been at this for over 60 years, believe it or not. Uh, I enjoy doing this program with Don. We always have good conversations. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, chime in. I I'm going to give a plug for our candidate training event. CPC is training candidates to run effective and winning races. It will be held in Frankfurt on February 2nd and 3rd. We have a great lineup of speakers and trainers ranging from elected officials, political consultants, media professionals, a range of other uh, people as well. Please join us February 2nd and 3rd. You can find out more information on our website at commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Very top of the page, you'll find out more information about the training. Again, go to Commonwealth Policy Center. Dot org, and you can register there. ...of the Commonwealth right. Policy Center. Usually I lead off with something. Why don't I let you start and uh, something you particularly feel that you need to tell the listeners this morning, Richard? Yeah, Don, one, the uh, program I just did in Somerset, uh, we talked a lot about our upcoming candidate training. Uh, this is where every two years, every major election year, we train candidates how to run effective and winning races. This is going to be February 2nd and 3rd in Frankfurt. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers and trainers. We've got several elected officials, including Jason Petrie from your neck of the woods, uh, State Senator Robbie Mills, who is Lieutenant Governor, uh, running mate with Daniel Cameron. Uh, we have a couple of different political consultants. We've got media professionals. A uh, range of issue of, of of speakers that can speak to the issues and uh, help candidates run effective and winning races. So, this is again one of the services that CPC does uh, across the state. And anybody interested in running for office or knowing what it takes to win a race, you can go to our website, CommonwealthPolicyCenter.org, and at the very top of the page, you'll find more information and how to register for our candidate training. Again, that's going to be February 2nd and 3rd in uh, Frankfurt. Don, the other thing I want to get out this plug right away too is we have an event coming to your neck of the woods, February the 8th. You may have seen this, but Dr. Al Moeller is coming to speak and uh, Living Hope Baptist Church is hosting this event. Jason Pettis is the pastor there. Uh, Dr. Moeller is uh, coming to speak on the topic of how to live a godly life in a culture that celebrates sin. Uh, Jason Pettis is going to talk about the, uh, many of the issues, uh, cultural, social, moral issues, from a pastoral perspective, really sharing a pastor's heart as people in the pews struggle with many issues of the day. Uh, Don, that event is free and open to the public. More information can be found on our website, again, at commonwealthpolicycenter.org. At the very top of the page, you'll find more information about the Al Mueller event. Again, that is uh, February the 8th. That's a Thursday evening at Living Hope Baptist Church in Bowling Green. <clears throat> so, yeah. On the website, it interests me, and I can get your choice. For instance, there is a state Senate bill. Uh, which would give exceptions to the abortion ban. Your, your thoughts on that? Don, we, that's Senate Bill 99. It was proposed by Senator David Yates of Louisville, and that would allow exceptions to Kentucky's abortion ban, which uh, really is born out of the last political cycle. Uh, Andy Bashir ran a heart-wrenching ad of a young woman who was... Uh, raped when she was a, just a teenager, a preteen, actually. Horrible um, circumstances. Uh, cannot imagine what she went through. 
And uh, there are people calling for exceptions to abortion right now, as it is. The only exception to Kentucky's abortion law is to save the life of the mother. Uh, we approach this from the perspective of compassion towards the mother, compassion in uh, her suffering and in her pain that she might have suffered because of sexual trauma, sexual assault. Uh, at the same time, we have compassion towards an unborn child. Uh, one of our concerns is that if the state can pick and choose who can live and who can die, where do you draw the line on that? Uh, the abortion lobby, which is pushing this, Planned Parenthood, the ACLU, uh, they're not happy with just exceptions, Don. They would like to repeal all of Kentucky's pro-life protections. The Planned Parenthood uh, crowd is in favor of abortion all the way up to uh, birth for any reason and in any method uh, possible. And the reason we know this is because they've opposed uh, restrictions on abortion on the on the age uh, of the child. You know, for example, there have been twenty week abortion bans. There have been fifteen week abortion bans. There have been six week abortion bans uh, going back over the last few years. And Planned Parenthood has opposed each of those. Planned Parenthood has opposed different types of gruesome abortions. Without going into detail and offending the sensibilities of our listeners, uh, Planned Parenthood does not care how that baby is how that baby's life is ended. Uh, and then as far as the reasons for abortion, the Planned Parenthood says that the, it's up to the woman. Uh, it's none of our business why she would uh, end the life of her child. And uh, it's just, it's a decision, a personal decision. And we have stood opposed to all of those arguments and that line of thinking uh, for years, and really since we began at Commonwealth Policy Center here uh, back in 2012, one of our goals was to restore a sanctity of life ethic in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And part of this was to acknowledge the uh, rights of the unborn child and to put protections into law. And by God's grace, we have seen that. Kentucky is one of 14 abortion-free states right now. And we want to keep it that way. So these are these are some of the reasons why we are opposed to this exception bill. We could dig a little deeper and say, well, how do you how do you verify if there was a sexual assault taking place? Uh, and this is something that Planned Parenthood is opposed to. They do not want to verify that. And now, if you don't verify, Don, then you open the door to anybody who says, well, I was assaulted or I was raped, and they could go to the clinic and have have the abortion. Uh, and that's problematic. Look, the pro-life movement um, here in Kentucky has fought long and hard to restore the sanctity of life for all human beings. And the reality is, is that all of us began in our mother's womb. We began at conception. And all of us, I think, take for granted to some extent that we've had laws that protect our lives. And of course, the culture has shifted. That's not been the case since 1973. Another major shift happened in 2022 with the Dobbs decision, which, by the way, did not ban abortions. But the Dobbs decision turned the issue of abortion regulation back to the states. And Kentucky has said uh, for the last several years that we are pro-life. We will protect life. We will acknowledge that life begins at conception. And uh, that's why we're we're having this debate now, because there are those who are opposed to that. They don't want to protect the lives of the unborn, and they are introducing the exceptions uh, bill, like Senate Bill 99. But as I just mentioned, Don, it will not end there. They will continue to push until Kentucky has abortion on demand for any reason, all the way up to the ninth month of pregnancy. And we stand opposed to that. Distortion this morning on the line. Uh, I don't know what if you turn in a different direction oh. or stood on your head. Oh, or... I might. I'm not standing on my head, but let me turn the phone towards me. Is this any better? Is this I it? I okay? So. I'll try to keep it fixed fixed right there. So, all right. Hopefully that works. Well, what about legislation to, to provide uh, for the election of members of the Kentucky? Board of Education, what, and, and also legislation to move um, uh, constant, uh, that uh, elections for constitutional offices, including the governor, 
to the even-numbered years, same as the uh, presidential and congressional uh, elections. That's a couple different issues there as far as um, elections. What do you think? Yeah, I'll take that last one first. There has been an effort, really the last couple of General Assembly sessions, to move Kentucky's constitutional office races, which includes the election for governor, to move those from odd-numbered years to even-numbered years when the president is on the ballot. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is because it would save local governments over $13 million is what it's projected. Anytime they have to uh, open the polls for an election, they've got to pay poll workers. I think there's overtime involved. There's the voting machines. There's a cost related to that. But it's projected to save local governments uh, about $13 million if we did that. Number two is that it would likely increase voter turnout. This last election for governor, uh, we saw 38% voter turnout, 9% lower than it was in 2019. And the idea is that more voters should be encouraged to participate. I've heard it said that there was voter fatigue. You know, after the 2022 election, people were burned out and they were, they were fatigued and therefore the turnout was lower in 2023. So there is an effort to, uh, to save money and to encourage uh, more greater voter turnout. And we do see, by the way, in presidential election years, that turnout is high. Uh, in Kentucky, last presidential election in 2020, I want to say it was in the 60th percent range, somewhere in there. So quite a, f quite a few more people voted there than did in the governor's race. We'll see where this goes. The amendment, the uh, Kentucky Constitution has to be changed. So this would go to the voters if it's passed. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. The other issue you brought up was moving the state school board positions to be elected positions instead of government appointments. As it is, the governor appoints really all of the boards and commissions across Kentucky. There are some 400 boards and commissions. And the Kentucky State Board of Education is one of those boards. Uh, he handpicks his people. Now, there's supposed to be a balance between Democrats and Republicans, male and female. Ethnicities are supposed to be represented as well. And uh, this would take this decision out of the governor's hands and put it into the hands of the people. Uh, State Senator Mike Wilson of Bowling Green, I believe, proposed that bill. And he, his goal is to depoliticize, if you will, that office. And it sounds kind of ironic because it's putting it into the political process. But when he says depoliticize uh, or make it less partisan, he, he's simply, I, I think he, he means to put it into the hands of the people. And in a lot of ways, I can see the, the wisdom in that. I think that candidates for school board should have to make their case to the voters. Here's what I believe. Here's the direction that I think Kentucky's education uh, should go in. Uh, you know, this is what I would do if I was elected. I think that's good for candidates to make the case uh, to the voters and then for voters to weigh in. Uh, so overall, I see that as a as a good thing. We'll see where that bill is going. I've not heard much since then. I have been in touch with Senator Wilson about doing an interview uh, with him on that uh, for my program, The Commonwealth Matters. And uh, we do plan to get together in the near future to uh, to talk about that. So, Don, maybe next time I'll know more to share uh, share with you and the listeners. Then, <laughs> yeah. other thing is, uh, speaking of education, mm -hmm. I noticed the Bluegrass Institute says that uh, more money spent on education doesn't necessarily promote better results. What about that? Yeah, they did a lengthy uh, report looking back at Kentucky spending going back to 1990 when CARA, the Kentucky Education Reform Act, passed, which uh, one of the things it did was it addressed funding disparity between school districts. And it came up with a new formula so that the poorer districts were getting more money. And the idea was that if you had more money, you could spend it on more curriculum uh, increased teacher pay, hire more teachers, that kind of thing. But the Bluegrass Institute found that the higher funding and more money to education did not necessarily correspond to greater economic gains. Now, there was some, uh, er, 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 let me restate that, it did not correspond to greater educational attainment uh, 
there was some greater educational attainment uh, that uh, benefited students, but it did not correspond well. There has been a huge increase in uh, funding for public education in the last uh, 30 plus years. And the question is, is are the voters, are the citizens getting their money's worth? And the Bluegrass Institute made the case that and the answer is no, there's not. Now, related to this, Don, is there really is a push to expand education freedom in Kentucky. Uh, the state Supreme Court struck down a bill last year that was enacted, the Educational Opportunity Account Bill, that allowed individuals and businesses to donate to a scholarship fund. And that scholarship fund would give money to low-income families who wanted to send their kids to private schools. The Supreme Court said, no, this is uh, taking money from public schools. I think that's a stretch, by the way. And uh, if you want to do anything like that, you need to have a constitutional amendment. And that's why House Bill 208 was proposed recently that would amend Kentucky's constitution to allow for school choice. The term that's being used today is education freedom, where charter schools would be allowed, educational opportunity accounts would be allowed, perhaps vouchers would be allowed. It, that amendment doesn't specifically address any of those. But what it does say is that the possibility for parents to have choice and for tax write-offs to take place if it's going to grant-making foundation or for charter schools to take place, that uh, the amendment would address that. And that has to pass first. So there is a major effort uh, with several groups across the state to, uh, to get this passed. I, it does have momentum in the House and Senate. I do expect this bill to pass this uh, legislative session. That means it will be on the ballot in November and Kentucky voters will weigh in. I do expect a lot of pushback, Don. Uh, the KEA is very much opposed to it. The NEA, National Education Association, is opposed to it. And uh, I think that's unfortunate uh, that, that they are. Um, but uh, we, we will see how that shapes up. But I do expect it to pass and voters will, uh, will weigh in in the November uh, election. Talking about Daniel Cameron earlier, what do you know about this uh, organization that he's now the uh, CEO of, the 1792 Project? Is that, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's a fairly new organization. Don't really know a lot about it other than looking at their website. And uh, it's, it's fairly new. It's just a couple years old. And one of the reasons why they formed was to stand against ESG. That's the uh, uh, Environmental Social Governments uh, idea of investing. And uh, he pushed back. Daniel Cameron pushed against ESG when he was attorney general. And the way I understand it is this, you have um, companies that have mutual funds, you have in, uh, financial advisors or financial companies that put together these mutual funds. And these mutual funds would encourage uh, companies that are mindful or promote ESG, which are considered by conservatives to be far left, woke, not necessarily common sense or not necessarily helpful to the economy. And in particular, his concern and Allison Ball weighed in on this too, our, our current uh, newly elected state treasurer, their concern was that Kentucky is a major coal producing state and ESG investing would hurt the coal industry, a significant industry in Kentucky. And anyways, Daniel Cameron's new group, the group he's working with, 1792, uh, is uh, very much opposed to this. They're pushing back against this ideology of investing based on um, those social priorities. So uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. I think one of the indications with Daniel taking that job, by the way, and I've not talked to him since the election, but I think that this is an indication that he's uh, not done with politics. He is staying present in the public policy realm and staying involved with a very important issue to many, uh, many people. So uh, stay tuned uh, to his future involvement in Kentucky politics. Speaking of stay tuned, stay tuned. We'll have a commercial break and be back with Richard Nelson right after these messages. Hey, all. Uh, Thanks for joining us here 
on the Camo Matters. We're taking a commercial break. Uh, Don Nigo and I are talking about a number of issues in the news. Always a good conversation. And uh, hopefully you're enjoying it too. Uh, Don and I have been doing this program for probably close to 20 years. I've been a guest in this program, but we've done this regularly for uh, more than a dozen years. So uh, I'm trying to talk to you and listen to this commercial at the same time, which this can be confusing. I got to make sure I get back in when Don comes off of his uh, break. I hate to be talking to uh, this little commercial break and then and then uh, override me being live on the radio. So this is a break. You're listening to the to Don Neagle and me talk about issues and events. By the way, CPC has two events coming up in the very near future, candidate training in Frankfurt, February 2nd and 3rd. And then in Bowling Green, we're bringing in Dr. Al Moeller to talk about how to live a godly life in a culture that celebrates sin. So more information can be found on our website, uh, org. You can find out more information about both events there. Go to commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Again, the candidate training, February 2nd and 3rd. We're going to teach and train candidates to run winning and effective races. If you're running for office, thinking of running for office, or helping on a campaign, sign up there, uh, February 2nd and 3rd in Frankfurt. And then uh, on February the 8th, we are bringing in Dr. Al Moeller to Bowling Green to talk about living a godly life in a culture that celebrates sin. Come and join us there, February the 8th. That event is free and open to the public. You can find more information at our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. At the very top of our website, you will find that information. So I think we're wrapping up here. I think we'll get back on the air with Don in just a moment. So, nope, another commercial. All right. So what's on your mind today? What issues are pressing to you? What issues do you have questions about? Uh, if you'd like to contact me in the Commonwealth Policy Center, you can contact us through the uh, message form on our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org, or you can go to our social media pages and uh, contact us there or simply send me an email at richard at Policy. Dot org Richard at commonwealthpolicy.org. If there's a question that you have, an issue that you're concerned about, if you'd like our perspective somehow, please uh, please contact us and let us know how we might be able to help. So, so good to uh, have you joining us on the feedback program here with Don Neagle. And uh, we're going to... Chris McGinnis is just wrapping up his commercials. Here we go. Yes, Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Richard, there's um, uh, legislation that would prohibit chip implants in the body. That's been written about in your blog. What What is that about? Also, would the legislation to limit police from collecting data by drones and cameras? What's that all about? Yeah, Don, that was a bill proposed by State Representative John Hodgson of Louisville. And it's really, it's a broad bill that would um, stop the government, whether it's the city government, whether it's a police force or even state government from spying on people or tracking people through, as you mentioned, chips. But it would stop, for example, um, cameras in public places it would it would say that you can't have cameras even if it there might be a good reason for it you know you might have a high crime area and we're going to put cameras up to observe well john hodgson has a concern and i have a concern too that that kind of information could be abused uh even if the intent is good uh where people we start tracking people or you're starting to you know, using that information in a in a way that's just in a free society, you don't want to see it used. And I think one reason why there's pushback against this is because you see what happens in totalitarian governments in China, for example, they have cameras everywhere. They're tracking their people constantly. And they have something called a social credit system, where if you have a Chinese citizen that has bad behavior, let's say they litter, <laughs> or let's say they're rude to another person. There are monitors in China that are tracking the behaviors of its own people. 
And if you lose enough social credits, you could be punished in China for, you know, for example, uh, you might lose your privileges to use the subway uh, or you might lose other privileges in that society. Now we say, well, that's China and that won't happen here. Well, John Hodgson and the proposal of this bill is making sure that that kind of thing won't happen here. Uh, it's to protect um, our privacy. It's to protect people from being um, spied upon. And this idea of chip implants too, I didn't know this, but in other countries, I guess in, in Germany, maybe there's other countries, uh, you can put a chip under your skin that will have uh, your identification. And if you're part of a health club, for example, you just put your hand up to the up to the uh, up to the door, and the door will automatically open based on this chip implant. Instead of having to get out a card or punching in a code, you simply put your hand up to uh, up to a device that opens the door for you. Now, John Hodgson is concerned about that again because of the abuse that it could entail, because of tracking purposes, because of you know if this kind of technology or this thing gets into the wrong hands. Uh, it could infringe on our uh, privacy and on our freedom. And that's something that uh, we should all be concerned about. I know John personally, I've reached out to him after he introduced this bill and I wanted to do a program with him to, to learn more. He, of course, he and many other legislators are very, very busy with the session. I've not heard back from him, but I am interested in learning more about uh, about his thought process uh, with this. Another point, um, Don, I think that's worth bringing up here is that Louisville has suffered uh, with a with a rash of crime, especially uh, in 2020 or after the George Floyd um, tragedy. Uh, there were riots. Um, there was vandalism. There were um, just a number of other terrible things that happened that would lead to people saying we need to crack down. We need to have more oversight. We need to we need to have cameras in other places. And even though John uh, Hodgson and his fellow legislators are concerned about crime, they're also concerned about protecting um, personal freedoms and to push back against the government that would uh, would infringe and possibly use um, tracking devices or cameras to infringe on our on our freedoms. So. I was really intrigued by the um, chip thing. I had no idea there was ever any consideration of chips. He just has that, just been case anybody ever tried to do it. I guess. I think he's being proactive, and part of it is to it wouldn't. I don't think it would regulate individuals if they wanted to put a chip and and use it for their own individual purposes. But it's just to prevent government from ever using that kind of technology to uh, to track citizens. And again, you know, we, we read these dystopian novels or we watch these dystopian movies like, uh, I guess, The Hunger Games or Mad Max, or there's a lot of dystopian um, media out there uh, and entertainment out there. But we do see this, the possibility of big government getting a hold of information that infringes on our freedoms. And uh, I think that probably has shaped us in how we think you know the hollywood movies and but also other countries too it's not just not just hollywood but you do see totalitarian governments misusing information like this and uh we're going to push back against it and i'm i'm going to push back against that too i do not want the government to have more information or more control over the people other than upholding the laws other than keeping us safe i want a strong police force i want a strong judicial system I want us to be to to feel safe to walk down the streets. But what I don't want is the government to be spying on people here. I don't want information that the government just happens upon um, and collects on people. I, I don't want that here. And uh, that's why I think a bill like um, Representative Hodgson's bill uh, is important. I'm not sure, again, how much uh, I'm not sure how much support this has, uh, but we will uh, we'll find out here in the near future. January 11th was the Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Talk about the significance of that. Yeah, um, Don, this was a topic that maybe 10 years ago, none of us have heard about. But human trafficking is an unfortunate reality in much of the world. 
Um, there are a couple of main reasons for trafficking. One is sex trafficking of women and minors. The other is slavery. It's uh, uh, organizations, businesses that take advantage of people and turn them into slave labor. Uh, I had a chance to interview a woman in Louisville by the name of Jean Allert. She directs a, a group called Institute for Shelter Care. And she works in the area of public policy uh, and ministering and helping other organizations that help trafficked women. She worked in Maryland for a number of years and had a uh, an outreach there for women who were caught in trafficking. And it was interesting um, to, to do this interview with her. I learned a lot of uh, really important things. One is that the United States is a destination place for sex trafficking. And there are people, young girls in particular, and young boys who are um, trafficked, who taken from their home country and brought here to this country for um, sex trafficking purposes. It's really, it's horrible when you think about what's going on. Uh, the other thing I learned in this interview was that uh, much of the sex trafficking here uh, in the country, and it's here in Kentucky, there was a news story not too long ago about a uh, mother who trafficked their child in eastern Kentucky. One of the things that uh, is coming to light is that uh, it's parents, believe it or not, Don, that are mostly responsible for trafficking their own children. 60% of children trafficked in this country are trafficked from their parents. Uh, and it's because the parents, in most cases, are addicted to drugs. And this is uh, this trafficking is used to sustain their addiction. I, I can't imagine that. I can't comprehend that. You know, parents obviously should be protecting their children from this kind of thing, and instead they are trafficking them. It is present uh, in Kentucky, as I mentioned, and it's something of great concern. I think it's important to talk about this, too, is that trafficking does not happen in a vacuum. It's not some idea that somebody just comes up with, yeah, I think that this would is a good idea to fulfill my sexual pleasures, which is perverse and um incomprehensible and it's and it's horrible when we think about what's going on but trafficking starts somewhere and it starts with sexual exploitation i would argue it starts with pornography the idea that sex uh, is something to be exploited that sex can be sold that women are objects that it's sex is something to be consumed and it started with hugh hefner uh with playboy uh, but now, today, it's uh, mostly online, much of it is video, and it desensitizes us to um, to sex, it desensitizes us and uh, to women and how women should be treated. And women, by the way, suffer more than anyone because they are the objects of exploitation. I'm saying all of this because to get to the point of trafficking, again, it had to start at a certain point. And in this country, we have objectivized sex. We have made it widely available. Children at very young ages are exposed to it. Read something the other day where uh, by the age of seven, uh, most children, if I, if I understood and read that correctly, most children are exposed to pornography. Think about that, by the age of seven. And uh, this is not good. It's not good for children. It's not good for their understanding of sex. And it's not good for our society. So maybe, Don, this uh, uh, issue of sex trafficking is a wake-up call for us to stand against this. It may be a wake-up call for us to stand against pornography as well. And to make those links between um, uh, introduction of pornography and the dangers of pornography to where it leads. And actually, sex trafficking isn't just the end of it. It gets worse than that, um, which is, uh, it breaks my heart when I think about what... Um, what's involved, the young lives that are at stake, the lives that are ruined. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Sound of Freedom. It was came out last year. It was one of the top movies at the box office. It was a surprise hit, but it featured a, uh, a, a Homeland Security agent who in the course of his work came across a sex trafficking ring in, uh, in South America. 
and he uh, he ended up rescuing kids. Uh, he left that work and, um, and made it a full time uh, full time uh, job for him. Uh, it was a it was a very difficult movie to watch at times. It was it was moving, uh, but it was based on a true story. And uh, this is something that uh, you know it's it's a horrible industry. Uh, it does happen across the world. I, I think we're talking millions of of young people and women are trafficked across the across the world. And it's something that um, we should be concerned about here. We should be mindful that it happens here. I would encourage any of the listeners to go to Institute for Shelter Care. They have a website. They're based in Louisville, Institute for Shelter Care. And you can find some of the reports and also find out what you can do to stop uh, trafficking here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I noticed um, that since uh, gambling on sporting events has become legal in Kentucky, that calls to the gambling hotline have tripled. Want to elaborate on that? Yeah, they have, Don, and that's no surprise that after uh, the sports gambling was legalized uh, last legislative session, it, it's not even been uh, allowed for a whole year yet. Uh, you, we heard a lot of arguments for bringing in additional revenue. I think one one of the projections was twenty seven million dollars would come in in the first year. I think they're on track for for bringing that in. But one of the things that was downplayed was the real people that it would affect, people that would become addicted to gambling, people that would lose more than they could afford to lose, and families that were affected by it. Uh, now we're seeing the fallout today. And and those, uh, as you mentioned, calls to the gambling hotlines have tripled since sports gambling has been legalized, it came into being in, I want to say in June of 2023 is when it was launched. So you know, we're looking at just six, seven months into it. And now we're dealing with the increased number of calls. Uh, I argued uh, publicly uh, with both of the sponsors of this bill in the state legislature that, hey, we got to look at the overall effects and the overall impacts this has. And uh, I don't think that that was taken seriously, but now we've got to live with it. The state will have to end up um, subsidizing uh, people who've lost it all. The state, come, is, the state is that safety net when people develop addictions, when people lose their resources, when people can't pay their bills, that it's a safety net that really, Don, this means you and me and all the listeners are paying for those uh, those who've developed this addiction. So uh, my, my word of advice to all those listening is that if you've not gambled, don't gamble. Uh, even if you see it as a form of entertainment, uh, look at how many people it's hurting. Uh, you may not know that you have a latent addiction. You might not know that you're prone to uh, some kind of addiction. My strongest recommendation would be to stay away from it and to find a better use for your time and your energy to put your hopes elsewhere. And these are arguments that I've made in the past, but to put your hopes in the, in other things and to stay away from it because you don't know uh, how it's going to affect you, your family, or your community. So. Richard Nelson is the executive director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. He's on the line this morning. Stay tuned. Back with Richard right after these. All right. Hey, we are in the last segment of Feedback with Don Nego. Thank you for joining us. And not sure how long this commercial break will be, but I'm going to get a commercial in for Commonwealth Policy Center. Uh, we are holding our candidate training event in Frankfurt, February 2nd and 3rd at the Frankfurt Country Club. This is where we teach and train conservative candidates how to run winning races. You can find out more information at our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Information is at the very top of the page. The other program that we're bringing to the area is uh, an evening with Dr. Al Moeller, and that's going to be in Bowling Green on February the 8th. February the 8th, uh, the topic will be living a godly life in a culture that celebrates sin. Love to have you join us there. 
It's going to be a great event. Uh, more information, again, for that event can be found at Commonwealth Policy Center. It's just the name of our group with the .org at the end, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Getting back to the first event I just promoted, if you have ever thought about running for office, if you are running for office, if you thought about helping on a campaign, then consider joining our candidate training event on Friday, February the 2nd, and Saturday, February the 3rd in Frankfurt. More information can be found at our website. Thank you, Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. So, uh, what about uh, the president of Harvard, Claudine Gay, resigning? And uh, the accusation is that college presidents in general are not condemning anti Semitism. How about that? Sure. Uh, and of course, uh, she testified in front of Congress uh, a while back about anti-Semitism on college campuses and on her campus in particular, where uh, there was harassment of Jewish students. There were threats towards D Jewish students. Uh, There's a really hostile environment, uh, very uh uh, racist or uh, anti-Semitic, no, I guess, uh, she could not bring herself to condemn those actions. And she was asked point blank, is this, is this compatible with a safe college campus? Is this something that, uh, are you working to uh, safeguard the freedom and the safety of these Jewish students? And she could not bring herself to condemn anti-Semitism. She could not bring herself to uh, uh, speak out against what these uh, other students who were harassing the Jewish students were doing. That was appalling. And that drew the ire of people all across the country. It got the attention of one of Harvard's large donors who said, look, I'm not going to keep donating if you cannot speak against something as simple as anti-Semitic anti harassment. I'm not going to support you anymore. That was probably the the thing that got Claudine Gay removed. Uh, now, she had other problems, too. She was involved with plagiarism in some of her published works. Uh, that's never a good thing when you're in academia and you're plagiarizing other people. Not a good thing. Uh, but that and then her failure to condemn the anti-Semitism. She wasn't the only one, Don. The president of uh, University of Pennsylvania had to resign because she, again, did the same thing, um, which it's interesting and it's telling at the same time how many in the academic world, many presidents of universities are going to be quick to condemn certain kinds of speech. So, for example, or certain kind of actions, if there was a group on college campus harassing let's say a transgender student or a homosexual student, that person would be run out on a rail. And I think that to the per, to the university president, if they were brought before Congress, they would condemn that kind of harassment. They would condemn speech that would target LGBT identified people. And there'd be no question that that activity would not be allowed. And the reason I say that is because that's what's happening right now on college campuses yet. When we see harassment towards Jewish people on college campuses, we saw the failure from some of the largest university presidents uh, in the college, or most, most notable presidents. They could not speak to it. And this speaks to uh, uh, an inconsistency. It speaks to really belies something else that's going on. There are certain groups, and this is what I'm getting to, there are certain groups that you're allowed to harass or to criticize, other groups that are untouchable. You can't touch them. And that doesn't sit well. It's, it's not right. It's not consistent. It's hypocritical. And uh, you really no groups, Don. And I'm not, by the way, advocating that LGBT students should be harassed. I'm not advocating that um, other minority students should be harassed on college campuses. But my goodness, if you're a university pr a president, you should be able to unequivocally condemn any kind of harassment, any kind of uh, uh, belittlement of other people on campus, any kind of uh, threats made towards other student groups. You better find your voice and speak against those things. And if you don't, uh, you may end up like uh, Claudine Gay and like the uh, uh, former president of University of Pennsylvania. And I'm saying that 
Look, that's not a threat. I, I know I'm animated when I talk about this, but I'm frustrated when there are threats against any person on college campus, which they should be for civil discourse. They should be for talking about ideas, but they should stand very clearly against any um, threats and any harassment to any student. And when that doesn't happen, I do get animated and I, and I do have a, a, a strong feeling against that, as you can tell here. And I think rightly so. What about uh, talking about transition? What about uh, uh, I read that detransitioners, uh, detransitioners are now picking out who are they and and how many and so on. Yeah, this is hitting mainline news sources. Uh, the New York Times is writing pieces on this. At one point, the New York Times was advocating for what they call gender affirming care. They were promoting this idea that children should be able to choose their own gender. And they were really filtering out anything that was negative of that as early as you know, just a few years ago. Now the New York Times and other publications for that matter are reporting about the regrets that gender dysphoric children have had in either hormone therapy or puberty blockers or in pursuing gender, what I call mutilation surgeries, really mutilating perfectly healthy body parts to try to look to give the outward appearance of the opposite gender. And these detransitioners, and there's a term that is, they, they're called sisters. These sisters are coming out because in the majority of cases, their transitions have ended badly uh, psychologically. It's not contributed to psychological health. Physically, many of them are suffering physical impairments from these high dose, doses of hormones or from these puberty blockers that have not allowed their bodies to develop as they are, were supposed to develop or from the surgeries, Don. There's a tremendous, tremendous regret involved with these and a lot of pain involved with those who have tried to transition to the opposite, uh, opposite sex, which is not biologically possible. You can have the appearance of uh, outward sexual anatomy, but you cannot have the DNA and you cannot have the genuine, um, you, you, we cannot generally uh, uh, transcend our God-given sex. You can't do that. I've had a chance to talk with um, a detransitioner uh, on a couple of occasions, a young woman by the name of Luca Hein, she came and spoke last year in front of a couple of committees on uh, gender transition. She had a double mastectomy when she was just 16 years old. She was put on high, high doses of hormones that made her appear male. It gave her a deeper voice. It um, kept her hips narrow. It uh, did, did some other things. And Luca was only 21 when she testified, and she had shared that because of these, these high doses of hormones, that she, her joints constantly ache. When her friends were doing a hiking and camping trip, she couldn't go with them because her body could not sustain that, even as a 20-something uh, young girl, a uh, young woman. Um, she had testified about her psychological state when she decided to transition um, she was not in the right psychological state to do that. She was just a she was just a, a teenager, and she had a very strong testimony, compelling testimony. And the, of course, the state legislature listened to her, listened to other at least one other detransitioner, and I think they did the right thing here in Kentucky by protecting gender dysphoric youth from making decisions that they would regret the rest of their lives. And we're seeing more and more of these stories come forward. More and more detransitioners are sharing their stories. And as painful as, as they are to hear and, as, and, and really the pain that they went through, um, I think it's a, it's a good warning and it's a, it's a service to others who are suffering from gender dysphoria, especially children. Um, I'm glad that those stories are coming forward and uh, that they're being heeded. Pope apparently has his own ideas on things. He's approved the blessing of same-sex couples. We've got about uh, four minutes left. What about that? Yeah, Don, after he, uh, the, now the Vatican issued a report, and essentially, as he said, that they were going to allow the blessing of same-sex couples. 
And there was a lot of uh, fancy footwork and um, verbal gymnastics in this report. I've not read the full thing, but I've read um, I've read a, a couple of comments from it, and I've read analysis on it. And uh, this has really created a lot of consternation in the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church has taught, and they've taught very well, um, about marriage and about complementarianism and about the purpose of sex and about moral boundaries for sex. They've taught very, very well um, on these areas. And this blessing by the Vatican and by the Pope of same-sex unions flies in the face of what the Catholic Church has taught for so long. And there are uh, many leaders in the church that are that are harshly criticizing what the Pope said and, and this document that they've come out with. It gives the appearance that the, the church is blessing same-sex marriages and same-sex unions. And that's something that the church doesn't have the authority to do. I mean, God is the one who designed marriage. He's the one that gives us boundaries for human sexuality. And for any church, it doesn't matter if it's a Catholic church or uh, the Protestant church, it really doesn't matter. The church does not have the authority to redesign um, what God has designed. The church doesn't have the authority to authorize what God has condemned. The God, you know, God says that marriage is good, sex should be within marriage, and there's no human institution, the church included, that can redefine what God has defined as good and true and beautiful. And uh, I suspect there's going to be more fallout from this. I do not think that the Catholic Church, and with this Pope leading it, I don't think that it ends there. I think that they've been on a path for some time to affirm same-sex relationships. We've heard uh, Pope Francis say other things that are troubling, affirming uh, LGBT identities. And by the way, this is an important point I need to make right now. There is a difference between affirming a behavior and lifestyle choices and affirming a human being. Uh, as a human being, Don, I can say this, that I am a sinner, uh, but I'm saved by grace. I don't embrace my sin. I don't stay in my sin, but I embrace my Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the message that the Pope needs to be sharing with people, not condemning people, but offering them hope. Uh, speaking of sin, warning against sin, not condoning or blessing sinful relationships, but but speaking of forgiveness, speaking of wholeness, speaking of Christ, who is the one who brings us healing and brings us hope into our lives. That is the message that the church has shared, and unfortunately, they have they have veered from that. So we'll uh, we'll see what other fallout happens. I suspect that there will likely be more here in the near future. Well, Richard, always good to have you on the show and looking forward to talking to you in uh, February. And keep warm and be careful when you're out and about. Will do, Don. One other last plug, if I could. The candidate training events coming up in Frankfurt, February 2nd and the 3rd. Uh, please join us there. If you're interested in running for office or helping on a campaign, go to camelpolicycenter.org. And then also, we're bringing Dr. Moeller into Bowling Green February the 8th. Join us for that event. It's free and open to the public. And again, you can sign up and register at commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Thank you now for ABC News coming up here on WRUS Ruckleville. Uh, enjoyed having uh, Richard on the program this morning. Right now it is 10 a.m. All right. Thank you all for joining us on Feedback this morning. God bless you and enjoy the rest of your day.